Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Covenant Cast. I'm your host, Zach. And I'm Steven. And I'm Jonathan. And today we're talking about the Dark Souls Kickstarter. All right, let's kick it off here with some answers to our question we asked on the last episode at the end of the episode. Uh, we were asking, favorite gaming convention and why? Mm-hmm. And uh, got some interesting responses. A lot of Gen Con answers. A lot of Gen Con answers. Yeah, Speaking I, of. I was actually hopeful to get responses about, like, oh, here's this, like, regional or local convention yeah. that I go to. Like, in Tulsa, uh, there's, like, you know, Tokyo and Tulsa, mm-hmm. where there's various things happening. There's a big uh, tabletop game uh, convention going down in Oklahoma City. A board game thing, right? Yeah, Roddy's uh, going to be there. It... The thing about it was, though, we literally only got answers regarding Gen Con. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. So we'll take Oops, them. Uh, appreciate well, I mean, that's the, the upside uh, of it. That's, that's why it is so big, is it I, hits I the majority I of the population. I should specify. It's like, you tell me your favorite non-national convention. But, John, hit me, hit me up. All right, so one. Alan Jones, uh, speaking to your point, uh, hashtag Ask Covenant, my favorite gaming convention has to be Gen Con, even though it's gotten huge. Ultimately, it ends up being part of the appeal, which I agree with. With its hugeness, you get to see what happens when every game company throws all their money in the spectacle at the exhibitor hall, and you see some of the most impressive and crazy things that you could never see anywhere else. Gen Con. Yeah, well, that is Gen Con, isn't it? No, it is, and it's, it's cool to see everybody come out. It's cool to see. It's the, the size of Gen Con continues to be mind-bending. We've said it before, and I'll say it again, that you could go there five, five years in a row and still not see the whole thing. The crazy thing about that too is it's relatively small in the terms of like you know even like World video gaming scope. conventions like E3 or E3 or something Comic like that. Con those kinds of things. So uh, we have a lot of work to do mm-hmm. if we want to go uh, try to carve out those larger. Which yeah, it's too. it's it is interesting to me when you talk about look at budgets for instance. You look at E3 and those are all the game companies throwing all their money at the spectacle. Well, those video games. And that's they're not even selling games, games there. They're not even really. Yeah. They're not even the hype train going getting people hyped. Think. And then if the, if this is, you know, Gen Con is actually pretty tame by comparison, but I do think that he that Alan is right. They are throwing all of their money into making it a spectacle and just kind of gives you an idea of the differentiation right now between the two industries. We got some growing to I, do. I think I like the spectacle and in the big, you know, everything that's going on and all the game companies are there, so it's pretty cool. But at the same time, it's like I think what I was talking about last time is the the there's a scale mm-hmm. of like the spectacle is cool. But, like, the crowd has gotten so big that, mm-hmm. like, dealing with parking and dealing with oh, yeah. the crowds and food lines and all that kind of hotel stuff. Hotel rooms. Hotels and stuff is, like, the cost, mm-hmm. not just literal money cost, but, like, mm-hmm. the effort and the mm-hmm. pain of doing it is getting higher. Yeah. And so, like, that's it's, where it's, it's starting to get questionable the I mean, It's, it's me. literally yeah. bursting at the seams. You've got now all the hotels surrounding also holding events. It's crazy. Yeah. Speaking of which, we have another answer here. Sal V coming in hot says, after attending Gen Con for the past five years, this is my first year... Uh, or excuse me, this is the first year Mm. that my gaming group has passed on getting tickets due to many factors. The two biggest have become the smaller chance of getting an affordable downtown hotel, which is essentially zero at this point, um, which we have become spoiled with, and excruciating 11-hour drive from New Jersey. It's going to be hard for them to fix that. Without a close hotel to walk back to with our spoils, the long drive just didn't make it worth it. The decision has been made easier by PAX Unplugged, which is held in Philadelphia. Here, I was able to play in both qualifiers for Destiny and X-Wing and had a great time. Hopefully the retail space will grow so that many more companies can showcase their games. And it's so much closer. So by now, uh, the default is PAX. Keep working hard, guys. Thank Thank you, Sal. Sal. We'll keep working hard. I like that. Hardly working. I think that's how I feel a little bit about Adepticon, where you're getting that experience of playing these events and meeting all these people from all over without having to... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> ben, ben yeah, just get it out. Yeah, just just get it out for goodness sakes. Uh, we're in the, the office, the marketing office, and Ben, <laughs> who's the video audio guy, always complains about noises, and he's over there just you know, coughing, coughing up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I like this where it's like the little more personal, smaller, like when you have, even when I say small, five to 10,000 people going yeah. to an event. Um, it's just more manageable on the, you still get the scale, but you don't get the frustration of literally 90,000 mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. in one downtown mm-hmm. kind of a let me situation. Tell you a little, let me tell you a little story. Um, so music festivals are a similar kind of experience, you know, where it, it started to be a kind of a thing, uh, you know, I would say probably, what, late 90s? Would you say that, Jonathan? Where you have yeah. like the, uh, you know, all the big like, my Pearl Jam style I mean, bands. Honestly, it probably started with Woodstock. Yeah, uh, of course it started with Woodstock, but then it got really the weird. We got into it later the, on, yeah. All the disasters that happened in various, and then all the, you know, uh, old folks at the time being, mm-hmm. ah, these hippies and all that. 
Anyway, so <laughs> it, it kind of really, the first time I learned about like music festival culture was when our cousin Scott was playing in a band and like oh. this idea that you would go to Colorado and experience this big group of people all watching bands together. Um, so I kind of got into that scene whenever I was in college and like the thing that I found myself wanting to do was finding the festival that was just big enough to have the accommodations that made it awesome and enough of like the good acts, but still small enough where like not everybody knew about it and it mm -hmm. wasn't a big mm -hmm. like thing that you had to deal with all the crowds and the, the tourists, if you will. Um, and I feel like these little gaming conventions popping up is a similar kind of thing. You're trying to find that perfect spot where like it's big enough to be everything that you want it to be, but still small enough that it feels intimate and secret and like mm -hmm. a very unique experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel like with conventions, that might be the best strategy. Can you find like PAX Unplugged is probably in that space right now, but three years from now, maybe it now is like kind of too big yeah. and you need to find that next little uh, thing that's coming up. And, I, and I, I do wonder if there's like a, if there is a population cap that you have to, that you should keep these things at so that it does achieve a cool. sort of intimate space, but also a little bit of, of crowd. And I know Comic Con does the crazy like registration oh, yeah, thing. Uh, yeah, and you they, they get a ticket if you had it last year or something. They like, basically, the people that had tickets last year are the first ones that get a chance to get tickets again. Mm -hmm. So like if, if people decide to go, there's no extra tickets. Versus like, Bummer. you know, if a thousand people <laughs> say, hey, I'm not gonna go, then it's offered mm -hmm. to, to people that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. couldn't get it. But like you have to basically get in line. Uh, but I, I don't think that they're limiting they have a large number. Yes, I don't think I they're at the magic so, number. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting, and I mean, it'll be cool to watch how conventions and places like Gen Con handle it mm -hmm. over because they need they the crowd. They sold out, yeah. you know, many days. That's true. So That's they have true. to only have a number of tickets available. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I think you can also kind of make can that only whatever sell you want. So yeah. many. I think there's a literal like fire code yeah. kind oh, of yeah. style thing, which is why they like have to really monitor. They're when trying you're to get a Lucas in. Field. That's like the, the next Oil big Stadium thing. Stuff. They're kind of there. They've kind of been be there cool. for a few times. Yeah. Also, a uh, fun fact: uh, Team Covenant has never had a downtown hotel room. Never. Yeah. Never. <laughs> Every year we ask Zach, please. <laughs> yeah, we're just waiting. <laughs> well, would well, you keep <laughs> buying all <laughs> those <laughs> products? You want, you want a food or a downtown hotel room? That's right. Well. We've chosen food every time, 100%. We're lean, we're Anyways, a uh, well, final <laughs> comment has nothing really to do with conventions as much, but I love this a comment. Great one. And just love seeing this kind of interaction. But, Lewis, um, I'm not even going to attempt the last one. De Roche. De Roche. De I Roche. I, there I was. I, I tried Des it. Roches. Uh, he says, uh, I'm in my late 30s and I passed through the quote unquote uh, chill transition that you guys seem to be in the middle of. I personally find lean back games far more enjoyable now because, as you said, it's really about the social connections and storytelling for me. I'm also finding myself becoming more and more interested in miniature and hobbying as well. I think part of the story with the miniature demographics has to be, quite honestly, the ability of people to afford the darn games and supplies. They don't call it a lifestyle for nothing. As I get older and more established professionally, getting into miniatures games seems more feasible to me. It was unthinkable to my younger self. As a kid, card games have a far lower financial barrier of entry. So with older gamers comes a generally more relaxed attitude. That might explain what you are experiencing in the miniature space. It's sometimes difficult to talk about the financial impacts of this hobby. But quite honestly, miniature games are just out of reach for many folks, particularly younger gamers. Perhaps God Tier will bridge this gap, at least partly. This is a great comment. <laughs> a plus all the way down. Uh, this actually, this, uh, I mean, I think it's so wise. Um, I had not thought about it like that, but it certainly makes a ton of sense. That the card games, that's your cheap, easy intro, buy a pack, get it on the table, boom, done. And that does appeal to someone with limited resources, someone with limited time. Uh, and then as you get both more time and more resources, uh, miniatures games are much more enticing just because that uh, option is now available to you in ways as it wasn't well, before. And I also think the other element of this, too, is that there's a lot of age restrictions there, right? Where it's like when you're 12 and you don't have a car, mm -hmm. carting around an army mm -hmm. of 200 models yeah. is interesting. Plus buying the paints and the glue and the... You can take your decks to school. You take your decks to school? Uh, we did. That's like, true. Like we, we very did. much did. And the other yeah. piece of this is that notice the term barrier to entry, not necessarily total cost. Because mm -hmm. I think that, that card games, if you're going to kind of really go there, uh, do very much have a high cost, like collectible games particularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you look at how much you spend on Magic, if you're a Magic player, versus um, like maybe War Machine or Warhammer. I don't know the numbers. I know that Games Workshop, you know, kind of raises the, the price uh, for the industry. But, um, you know, over the course of a year, I think they're probably comparable, if not card games being more expensive. But, like, I can buy a $15 starter deck versus starting a miniatures game is at least $100, 250 because mm -hmm. 
you know, the thing might be 100, and then you do have to start, you have to build a library of hobbying materials mm -hmm. to then start on your first project. Yeah. Um, so that the, the barrier of cost. the beginning cost is really one of the most significant and things. And part of that, though, is the traditional miniatures game was maybe $100, $150 models to start combined with a $80 to $100 rule book that you need to have, plus you need the glue, plus you, if you're going to actually paint it, you need to paint, mm -hmm. plus you need the time to do all this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a lot of elements there. But that does ask, you know, beg the question, we have a game like God Tier um, from Steve Forge coming in that is quicker, more cost effective. Trying to address that concern. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like, is that even a viable strategy? Because mm -hmm. it's like, is part of this the, like if you're removing those elements, like does that really change anything? Are people still going to gravitate towards the easier, faster kind of stuff. Well, I so. think that's the bet they're making, right? Yeah. You don't need you don't need paints. You don't need rulers. You don't. You really don't need anything. You need the three boxes for the three champions, and you're playing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they have to assume that that's going to work. All right. Speaking of God tier, let's dive in. So uh, to kind of set this up a little bit, why are we talking about the Dark Souls Kickstarter that was over two years ago? Uh, is a pretty good thing to wonder if you're yeah. listening or watching at this point. I'm wondering it. Uh, so <laughs> we we ran into DC, who we had on the cast a couple episodes ago. Um, he was a designer. He used to be a developer for Monster Apocalypse, which mm -hmm. was a game we loved. We ran into him uh, at Adepticon 2017 outside of like an elevator, and we were catching up. And that led uh, very quickly, I think it was that evening, mm -hmm. to uh, Stephen and I went uh, and grabbed some food with DC and Matt, who's one of the co-founders of Steamforge. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were talking, there were a lot of like philosophical things we agreed on about the industry as an example with miniature war games. One of the problems being how difficult it is for a new person to get in. And so we had a pretty just great conversation, and we always get excited when we have those. But at the time, you know, there weren't any Steamforge games that we were particularly excited about. So we, we looked at Go Ball and we got the kickoff mm -hmm. box and it was mm -hmm. great. It was cool, but it's like uh, that's about as far as it went for us. Yeah, yeah. It's still, it's like, yeah, it didn't still didn't fit our sensibilities, and they, but they were going in the right direction. I think is one of the things that we yeah, which is cool. They were switching to plastic, preassembled. Mm -hmm. They were moving a lot of the barriers. Nice there. like startup uh, kind of. Uh, not campaign, but instructional scaffolding. Yeah, how to play, how to play so, pass yeah. the ball, yeah. and then do this. Um, the ball, yeah. So that was all cool, and we checked it out, but that's kind of where it ended. And then as time went on, they started talking about this God Tier game, um, which we've talked about several times on the cast. Uh, but they started talking about it, and you know, when we lose, lose my pen is what we do. <laughs> This is going to be a crazy episode. When we uh, when we start looking at a game, um, one of the one of the steps for us is really taking a look at the company and the company's mm -hmm. history, um, because we care a lot about the products we sell, and you know if we're going to recommend it, we want to actually be able to recommend it. Um, and so as we started looking, though, we kept noticing uh, one of the conversations around Steamforge that was just happening mm -hmm. all over the internet. Uh, was about the Dark Souls Kickstarter. Yeah. And the reason being that people were complaining. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, yeah, basically what happened from my perspective is I got I got super into Dark Souls. Uh, not Dark Souls, uh, God Tier. I got I got into it. I wanted all the information I could. I yeah, got you, involved you became with, obsessed. with the... Yeah, so that did. magic. You're it, in the eye. It, you it had, yeah, game, it, had, right? it had a little... It had, it, and it still does have, have some magic to it, uh, which I'm really excited to, to see if that pays off. Um, but it was like, it seemed to me like every post or every other post that I found out about this game on Facebook was then accompanied by somebody being very angry about something that they were owed. And it all kind of went back to the Dark Souls Kickstarter, and I couldn't really get a complete picture of what was going so on. So it was like, oh, look at this new God tier model. And someone comments and is like, where's my, where's stuff? my stuff for yeah. Dark Souls? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we, doing due diligence, had to, <laughs> yeah. had to dive into that. <laughs> had to look at that. Uh, and, and we thought that this would be, so this, this episode should be going up um, around the time of the God tier Kickstarter going up. Yeah, and, I think it's going up this, uh, right now, probably, as mm -hmm. of this this posting? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it'll be similar it'll be like, time uh, when it happens. We're going up. Um, and uh, from what we understand, uh, like they were saying at Gamma, and we talked to them at Adepticon a couple weeks ago again, it's like a two-week Kickstarter to basically start the process of printing the models. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they're mm -hmm. doing an alpha test that they did, uh, started a couple months yep. back where people have these alpha sets and they're playing the game and they're changing mm -hmm. things every week. Yeah, and which is still ongoing. Uh, that yeah. A lot of people were afraid it was going to um, stop with the Kickstarter. I, I think it, this is one of the key things that is not being communicated at this point in the process. Um, and I, I consistently get the feeling that Steamforge, you know, they have their hands full with all of the necessary bits of production and getting this Kickstarter ready and getting things like moving that, you know, clearly kind of communicating how everything's working to the public at large has not really properly been done. And this happens all of the time, just basically, because a lot of times you have to prioritize mm -hmm. where you're going to well, go. Well, game companies aren't necessarily, like publishers built 
for that. Right. Like right. Even, it's the, like, even the biggest ones in the industry even, sometimes are great They might post at a it. blog, but it's like who who eventually reads it and shares mm -hmm. it and gets that information out there. But from everything that I can tell, like the uh, this Kickstarter is all about just getting the molds starting, yeah. like getting the like, manufacturing going yeah. and whatnot, because we know that that's an unchanging variable in this game. We know that the models are going to look like this, they're finished, and we can go start getting those printed. Mm -hmm. Meantime, the game is not anywhere near done. Yeah. Um, we know that the rules can change day by day, mm -hmm. week by week. Like We don't have to print those rule books until right before the game mm -hmm. launches. Or ever. Just or digital. ever. You could technically have them digital. So that's the, the thing that I think is most important, is to understand that this Kickstarter is not about, here's the finished game, mm -hmm. go get it. This is literally just, we need to jumpstart production so that by the time everything else is ready, we have the models in-house and we can move the game and we can watch the game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's, you know, that's hard to understand. If you bought into the early access kit, um, we have the $250 purchase there. We get all these models and you're playing the game. And if you're thinking, this Kickstarter's gone live, they must be finished with the rules. Right you're going to be sorely disappointed because <laughs> right. it's like, this game is not done. Yeah. Like, yeah. the rules are not ready. And there are some, you know, upsides and downsides to doing things that way. Mm -hmm. But it's important to note that that is the way things are being done. Yeah. Uh, and that's important to note. Yeah. They say done enough to get a feel for what the game is going to be so people can make an informed decision. Uh, the models are already done, but the game is certainly not in a final state. And the one thing that, that uh, I always heard uh, whenever we were talking to both Matt and DC is talking about the first day that your game releases, you'll get more playtesting done uh, than the entire development cycle. Uh, but, however, uh, the, as soon as your Kickstarter ends and you have some rules to go out to people, that, that's a good way to get in a lot of people's hands as well. Yeah, trying to avoid that like first day, oh my gosh, something is not working like we thought yeah. it should, right? Yeah. Yeah. You just want to get as many, and they're, they're being very open about the alpha test, and I think that's really nice. For, and some people won't like that. Mm -hmm. It'll be like, you're giving me an un, completely unfinished product and saying, hey, throw money at it. Right. A lot of people are not going to like that, and that's the beauty of Kickstarter. <laughs> you don't have to spend money. You can, you can leverage, like, you can weigh the risks and the rewards of what might be going into backing a project or not and uh, make your decision based on that. Yeah, yeah. and we'll, we'll come back around to that. So I want to kick it off here with basically, so what's going on? What happened yeah, what with Dark Souls Kickstarter? So uh, they launched this Kickstarter on April 3rd, 2016, mm -hmm. um, and it funded in three minutes. Which is insane. So I can't imagine they were expecting that, right? No. Like, it's a Dark Souls, you know, it's a popular video game franchise, but you mm -hmm. never really know if that crossover potential is even relevant. Yeah. Well, and the crazy thing to me is, like, the people that backed it within three minutes cannot have known. <laughs> right. It's like, Dark Souls board game, done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I like, mean, the, 100 bucks, like 100 bucks, maybe. Money, right? Yeah, it was like, I think it was like uh, 80 or 90 pounds. Because okay. they're they're in the UK. Yeah, uh, but is that pre Brexit pounds or post Brexit pounds? <laughs> I think it was pre. That was pre <laughs> pre pre so, pounds. So more valuable. <laughs> yeah, uh, but funded in three minutes, which is crazy. And then you advance to May sixteenth, um, which is when the project was completed, mm -hmm. and it was three point seven million pounds uh, across thirty one thousand backers. Is crazy to me, by the way. That so th and thirty. That's yeah. Let that's me just right. Do, hold on. Let me do the math on that. Do you know how many? Just uh, <laughs> just you've seen some numbers. It's well. like a little over a hundred dollars a person. Well, yeah. Well, Steve's looking pounds. it up. Um, do you know how many? If they were to just fund, do you know how many customers they would have gotten? A thousand. Um, so I think that the original. I, I don't know the exact math, but I thought I think they were trying to raise like three or four hundred thousand mm -hmm, pounds. Mm -hmm. And so at a hundred dollars, right? You're looking at three thousand. Okay, one hundred twenty pounds per 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 yeah, backer. Yeah. So that'd probably be like one hundred sixty, one hundred seventy. Yeah, and now. Uh, Dollars, US Be aware, dollars. that is the amount that clocked in at the initial time of funding, mm -hmm. which we will come back to uh, as we continue so this story. If Give they, us that timeline. Let's say they were expecting so like 4,000 backers, and then they ended up with 31,000 That's backers. a different scale. That's a, that's a little yeah. bit different. Uh, but So November 19th, which is June, July, August, six months later, mm -hmm. okay. they have what's called a backer kit survey that goes out. And so this is, when you kickstart something, a lot of times backer kit's a tool that gets used um, to basically submit Here's my updated address. I did this with the Takedo Deluxe I got a few years ago. It's like verify your address. That's right? a funny story. Too. Yeah, that's a, that's <laughs> a fun. That was also delayed. So I, well, we haven't talked about the delays yet. But anyways, uh, so you fill this out, and also a part of the backer kit thing um, at the time is, uh, hey, uh, actually, and this is a complaint that popped up a lot because they were like, hey, you can go to the backer kit. Then people go on. It's like, hey, you estimated shipping to be eight pounds, and now it's twenty-two pounds. Mm. And it's like. Okay, 
So that's a, this is a, this is a problem, and I don't know when Brexit happens. So that could be funny <laughs> in here because if you if you backed it before Brexit, <laughs> yeah, and it's and like, like, and ah, maybe that's part of what happened no, with maybe. shipping. I don't know. Probably, not, um, probably but not. shipping got more expensive. So that's when you like go on because like I think when you you kickstart it, it's like you're pledging eighty dollars. Mm-hmm. That's immediate. Yeah, and then the backer kit basically syncs up. All right, you did an eighty dollar thing. Now we need this information from mm-hmm. you, and here's how much shipping is going to be to your so specific you, address. And you're on the hook for shipping. You're on the hook for yeah. shipping, not included. Because sometimes Kickstarter say shipping included or yeah. free people, shipping. People hate shipping or not. costs. Yeah, they, myself included. They really do. I mean, it's fair. We're trying to know, free ship can. as much as we can. It's just um, but so November 9th uh, thing. So January 6th is when the backer kit thing closes. You have to have your information in. Um, but also during the backer kit phase, there's what are called add-ons. Mm-hmm. So this <laughs> is if you you got the core set with all your stretch goals. Here's other things you can actually add. Right and nice. and when the backer kit little, little upsell yeah okay, little upsell. upsell so when the backer kit closes they get charged mm-hmm. for all the stuff you wanted to add on right yep. people are still okay this is exciting we've been seeing updates like we're, all these and cool they've been posting pictures miniatures. of like the miniatures and mm-hmm. the factories and stuff it's like okay cool so this is now um, eight months after the start of the thing only seven months after it's been funded right um, and this is 2017 so we advance a little more in March. Um, and they post a cool update that's like, and I went back through and I was looking at all the different updates. And March was the estimate at the time the backer kits closed. Yeah, when the backer kits closed, it says, hey, we're expecting, the original projection was April, and it's like, we're expecting to hit it a month early. In 2017? And is that, is that people, is that everybody? So waves, how are they waving this out? That's not known yet. We don't know anything, okay. No, that's just a standard thing. Uh, so the so, implication is that uh, it, everything will be out by well, and that's March okay. 1st, wait, actually, let me go back. Um, when it says the estimate is March one, and then it, that's when they announce wave one. Okay. So okay. they say we're going to ship um, the basically. There's three waves. There's going to be the base game, then there's going to be um, the stretch goals, mm-hmm. uh, or phase two or whatever expansions. It was expansions. And then phase three is going to be stretch goals. Okay. And it's going to be laid in. Right? Okay. But that was also a change. Because when and they originally kickstarted, the expectation was a single shipment. Yeah. So do you pay shipping three times now? You do. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so not only is so, it eight dollars to twenty dollars, it's eight dollars to twenty dollars times three. Yes. So you pay you know hundred pounds for your mm-hmm. thing, and now there's a sixty pound extra shipping. Now we're cer- we're certain about this. This is just what we've gathered from. So. They don't say this in their update, but the comments with the update would have me believe <laughs> that's what happens. Okay, um, good, good hard, and again, hard it, hitting it, journalism I would love, here. Yeah, I mean, I would love, it's, it's hard, I mean, there's no one documenting this. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, if you were a Dark Souls Kickstarter and any of these uh, facts are off or wrong or whatever, or something different than you experienced, uh, I'd love to hear about it in the comments, mm-hmm. uh, because that the goal here is accurate Accuracy. as possible. Yeah. But there's more, a more macro conversation about things that are happening that is what we're trying to get into. Uh, so then March 30th, right? So by the way, this is March 30th. The March oh, was projected. Oh, the March, right? yeah, the March that was yeah, going to go Which out. is the very tail end. Yeah. Some would say um, one of the last days in March. <laughs> yeah, and, and they, they, were, they were, it was basically like, uh, you know, hey, there's, looking at April again, uh, then they reveal the, there's like this big assembly line in their office where they've mm-hmm. got all the boxes and all the pieces and you can see them building the sets to mm-hmm. ship, ship them out, right? Well, hey, that's, you know, you're, you're at least They're showing off. You're yeah. showing some stuff. Um, and you have to imagine, too, like you don't even have a warehouse that can hold all of this stuff, so you do have to send it out in waves. Yeah, we're talking, I, th- I think, because like people that kickstarted it also could add on like extra copies of the game. I remember seeing somewhere on their thing like 40,000 units was mm-hmm. the like, here's how many core yeah. units we're shipping. Which is big, mm-hmm. Let's, and and we'll get to the box in a second. Uh, in that same update, they were like, part of the issue that that caused a delay is that they had to increase the size of the box this is because fantastic. the components and the miniatures weren't fitting. So the, the the miniatures got made a little bit too big. Well, the they... miniatures got made all the the maps and the tiles and all the pieces and the way like the the thing to protect the miniatures from getting squished in the thing because it's pretty assembled. Oh no. Other than, so it was like they showed original box and it's like the the actual box is like bigger, but that means you get less units in a case. Yeah, guess what? That ripples through. Oh everything. my gosh, yeah, so, that is a disaster. That is, a, <laughs> that is the so, capital D disaster. So you get less units in a case. Can you imagine that conversation? Which means shipping gets more expensive. You also like they literally were talking about how like you can only get so many cases on a shipping truck. So the estimate for. Every number they had just basically gets blown. Because everything is times this, Mm -hmm. you know, seven inch margin or four inch margin, whatever it is that. So they reveal that and it's like, but, you know, we're still expecting to ship this first wave in April. 
Can we pull over the side of the road here for just a second? I just, I want to, I want to, this is what the, the decision I think happened. This is purely conjecture. But basically what you're, what they're saying is we either remake all or at least some of the models, which sends it back through the China thing, blah, blah, blah. Or that. we make the box bigger. You got to do that. Which also messes stuff up. Well, and it's the, the last of two evils. Again, I, if you, I don't know if you remember, we, because we had a, when they did this wave, they shipped us a copy. Because mm -hmm. we'd talk and it was like, hey, you should check this game out. And opening it, I don't know if you remember or not, there's no extra remember. space. Uh, but yeah. it's not just the models. Because there's this, the bottom half is probably the models. Mm -hmm. But then it's like the whole the, the tiles, maps, tiles the, yeah. and all the tokens and all that kind of stuff. So they reveal that and it's like, we're expecting to ship the first one in April. So April 2018. So mm -hmm. we're now about a year after the Kickstarter. Lesson learned. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to lessons <laughs> strongly in a minute. Uh, about a year after the Kickstarter, they ship the first wave. Of okay. Do we know how many units that is? Wait. Not precisely. That's a year after the Kickstarter and... But it's, it's still kind of on their timeline, right? It's a day. Yeah, it's it's a, a, day. a month after their March estimate. Their March, we're going to be a month early estimate. Yeah. Because okay. the expectation was kind of April cool. along. Uh, but this is when issues really start to begin. Now? Well, <laughs> besides everything else we already talked about. So then more issues ensue, right? Which okay, is, tell me. Um, in July, they post an update. So this is two... And this is... There was random updates in the middle, but... There's update posting. So, hold on. The first thing that you can't do is ghost on stuff. And mm -hmm. that happens on Kickstarter all the time. Mm -hmm. Companies say nothing for seven months and then randomly show up. So they didn't do that. And here's the thing. So I've backed a lot of uh, things on Kickstarter. I actually had uh, Kickstarter things that I've done. And the, the biggest... The instinct for human beings is whenever something goes wrong, to not talk about it until it's fixed. Yeah, and until that you is, have it fixed. Until you have it fixed. Until you have it fixed. Yeah, you don't want to say, hey, we have this problem. We don't know how we're going to fix it. But you wait until, oh, we've got a solution for it. By that point, it's way too long. But it's human well, nature. And, and this happens constantly. And I, I get it because part of the problem that I haven't been talking about here is, you know, with the backer kit, right, and you have 30,000 people, um, one of the things that, uh, and I, I'm, I, don't, I think we'll eventually get to it, but, like, the number of people contacting them mm -hmm. was it's immense. It's got to be crushing, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And... It, we'll, we'll just keep rolling. But yeah. so just come July, they officially post, and this is one of the things I want to know. There were updates going on pretty much every couple of weeks, kind of a thing, which is cool. But there was a delay to Australia for whatever reason, and so they decided to airship it to Australia at their cost. So it was like we're literally shipping to Australia individually. Instead I think of they're just probably losing money at this point. I won't be surprised if that's where we get. But this in this same post, they apologized for the communication. Okay. And their like lack of clarity, even on the wave thing, where it wasn't clear this was going to happen, and this is how they have to do it because you can't ship the corset plus this much. I mean, it's like you're shipping everyone a case of stuff, which is a crazy way to ship it. But uh, they also said that they had hired staff to reduce the wait time on a response from three weeks to a few days. And now, okay, so a little a little side note on that from our uh, we have it. We can give a unique take on this because we actually engage in hiring staff, particularly in this industry, uh, consistently. <laughs> yeah. Here's the other thing, man. I mean, like, so we've been looking for a retail uh, specialist for how long now? Eight months? Seven months? Six mm, months? Five months? Four months. Four months? But Almost got there. I can say eight. <laughs> uh, but to, to essentially be able to, to be like, we're in the middle of a disaster, and now we have to try to hire and onboard somebody to who can represent someone, our yeah. brand to a bunch of angry customers and not make them more angry, then now you're spending time hiring and mm -hmm. onboarding. Yeah. And, so and onboarding it just, takes a ton. So of you work. have to be willing to like make the bet that the investment now is worth the gain over the next six months. That's crazy. Well, and this this kind of points out one of the things I, I will want to talk about, and I'll just kind of mention here, which is like the reality of there's a whole lot that goes into publishing a game that has nothing to do with actually designing or printing a game. Mm -hmm. uh, one of which is if you have thirty thousand customers, the support requests you're going to get, especially. If you're not communicating well or mm -hmm. stuff goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, I remember seeing a couple of their posts where it's like, hey, we don't have an answer yet because Chinese New Year. Yeah. But like Man, that just shuts the world down. <laughs> yeah. you know? But but like when we get back, when they get back, we'll try to get an answer. And it's like not not clearly communicating with people mm -hmm. leads to more questions. Mm -hmm. But also sometimes if you say, Hey, here's a problem, we don't know how we're gonna fix it. And it's like, what if five thousand people are like, Hey, I want a refund? Yeah. And it's like, you're not gonna that's not how Kickstarter works. Right. But you still have to respond to five thousand people. Yep. Yeah. Or yeah. they just think you're totally like running away, skipping town with their money. Yeah. 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 So um, this is where some more questionable decisions uh, get made. So that's you know, it's like okay. So they're kind of in panic mode now. Yeah. This and is and so another that. thing that happens in the same customer service vein is like you get your set, right? Mm -hmm. What if your big boss is missing? Mm-hmm. 
right? Which happened. It's like your two of your the tiles you need to play the game are missing. <laughs> I'm <laughs> feeling sick. Yeah. Can we? Okay. So can we just get through the timeline and then come back? Yeah, to the we'll points? come back. Okay. So we'll we'll do that. So um, I can't handle this. <laughs> yeah. Then August 10th, which is uh, a month after that update, they reopen the backer kit. So that is the hey, we have new add-ons that we're excited to tell you about. You can add more stuff on. Hmm. After they've failed to deliver. Yeah, but at this well, point, they got they've, wave they've, one out. they've communicated, so a lot of people are like, okay, I, I'm, I'm having to pay for multiple shipments, sure. so I may as well add some more stuff on so that uh, my shipment goes, goes a, a longer way, right? Uh, but then, um, two things happen. One, uh, they announced more delays mm -hmm. after reopening it and oh, <laughs> getting no. more money. Then, on September 25th, they announced the Resident Evil 2 Kickstarter, uh, which, by the way, funded within an hour. Um, but this time they only got 8,000 backers. The optics of that. Uh, and obviously people were frustrated because mm -hmm. it's like you haven't even fulfilled on your last one and yeah. you're doing another yeah, one. Oh, that's a real problem uh, too. And then a month later, in, or a couple weeks later in October, uh, a Wave 2 delay update. That was the delay after the backer kit, after Resident Evil launch, and then it's like, oh, there's actually a delay on Wave 2 um, due to Chinese Golden Week. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real note. I don't even know what that is. You know what, but you know what, in, in a lot of ways... I will say that obviously right now, having talked to a lot of people at Gamma, sorry, I just broke my own rule. Uh, you know, manufacturing in China seems to be the only way that this makes fiscal sense for a lot of the board game industry at this point. Mm -hmm. But it comes with its amount of risks, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. so you can avoid all of this by not manufacturing in China. And I think a lot of companies are starting to get to the point because China's getting more middle class. They're getting that mm -hmm. kind of... They're getting more expensive. They're getting more expensive. So as that starts to happen, it's like, well, where do we move manufacturing? Mm -hmm. And this goes back to an old conversation that we have, which is like, maybe these games just need to cost more uh, to do it well and Future to avoid these kinds of problems. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, so Golden Week, and then in that post, they <laughs> say, now, now they've, they, again, they apologized for communication last time, and now it's like, hey, we don't have information yet but we want to let you know. And it's like, we don't have solid info, so we can't estimate anything. Um, now, October 23rd, Resident Evil finishes 800,000 pounds of a Kickstarter, so it does fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, Certainly not the smashing success that Dark Souls was. November, still yeah, November 21st, so now we're about a year and a half past the original Kickstarter. Uh, wave 2 estimate given for July of 2018. Mm -hmm. Wait, we haven't even gotten there yet. No. Oh my gosh. Wave yeah. 3 this nightmare is, is not even over. September 2018. Uh, and then lots of complaints about opening the backer kit and then announcing another delay. Um, and then finally, we arrive at this past March, um, which Ch Chinese New Year finishes. Um, they have confirmed that Wave 2 is, and this is recently, uh, March 13th, Wave 2 is expected in July. Uh, wave 3 is still expected in September, as they've said. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this beast will have been uh, ridden. If fully. anyone wants to kind of get a quick update on everything, this November, the November update, where they, it's massive. They break it down, yeah. They apologize, they list everything out, what's completed, what's still in tooling, where everything's at. Uh, they say, hey, this is gonna be this, this is gonna be this, we're not gonna change it anymore or ever again. Um, we've got it figured out, here we're reopening the backer kit, obviously. Um, but it was, it was a very extensive, and I think heartfelt, and uh, they try to be as informative as possible. Um, but yeah, you, they're not blameless, right? I mean, like, no, no, no. They're, yeah, they're, I mean, I, I I mean that's, they're making up. It's the for best. It. It's the best. I mean, you can either try to recover or you can do bad. Yeah. And so they're like they they're treading water in the sense that they're not drowning at that mm -hmm. point. Well, and I there's a lot to say here, right? Where it's like, where did they go wrong? This um, is insane. And there's a lot to be learned as someone who might kickstart something and someone who might use Kickstarter. Like, there's a lot of lessons here. And someone who might kickstart God tier. That's really why we're here in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. It's like, how did Resident Evil 2 go? Do we know anything about that? Is it out or done? I believe it went very well. Because if it's I've still... Heard, I haven't heard anything well, about that, Resident Evil. That, that finished in October. So we're still within a year. I, that hasn't shipped or any of that. But here's the crazy thing, though. If you have... D uh, this one, Dark Souls, <laughs> not one. even, I mean, really end of year is kind of when all of this maybe gets out. And then Resident Evil behind it, and then God Tier also in the pipeline. Well, so in the How can that work? The interesting thing is that they actually, maybe for this reason, went to Indiegogo to do a uh, plastic conversion for Guild Ball. So they mm. basically kickstarted it on Indiegogo. But you keep the money no matter what, right? Um, yeah, but the, because what's also worth mentioning here is that prior to Dark Souls, uh, Steam Forge was Guild Ball, mm -hmm. yeah, which is a miniature soccer fantasy game where and well loved. Uh, that's a, a well respected. Very much worth mentioning that it, a lot of threads I see come up on this. Eventually, someone always chimes in and is like, "Yeah, 
But they have done so well with Guild Ball. They've done so good by me with Guild Ball. So there is that. Yeah, so the Guild Ball is also going on. Um, so their capacity to do more than one thing at a time is obviously exists. But people were upset, right? It's like you haven't even... You've no, come nowhere close to delivering on Dark Souls and you're launching the next thing. Mm -hmm. well, but I'll tell you what. Here's what it seems like to me. And I don't, I don't yeah, have I the say, information. We, we run a business. We can maybe be able to shed some the, light on this. There's also one piece of this that we didn't mention, which is Dark Souls went to retail. Ah, uh, yeah, yes, when, that's correct. Oh, yeah, I remember. So that was... Um, I thought I... Like, I thought that, that, that to me is like... That was a big oops. Yeah, yeah, that was May, June, 2017. It's an oops moment, but it also that strikes me as the kind of decision that you make whenever you can't fund the next six months this of is, your operation. When you, when you start looking at it like that, where it's like they have maybe not made any money off Dark Souls, and they are just determined to get it out to save their reputation. I mean, they've hired, you know, they had to do the box issue. They've hired two new people, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's what I was. That's where I was going with all this, which is, I don't know, but. The feeling I get from now looking back from no... We've interacted with them, right? Yeah, we've interacted with a lot of companies that have had a lot of disasters, yeah, actually. But the feeling Most. of this, to me, <laughs> is you launched a Kickstarter, it went way better than you expected. Mm -hmm. You did not factor in what it means to be a company that's publishing this big of a game. Yeah, you got excited. Yeah, and so like I'm talking... This is accounting to finance to distribution to customer service to marketing to. Did those departments even exist? No, mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, they're, they're a small company, right? <laughs> um, but so the first wave started shipping in April, and then it hit retail in May or June. And yeah. so I think the reason the waves were even made was at some point the math's not adding up, and this is a problem. You've seen this with so many Kickstarters, and most Kickstarters, when this happens, fold. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, we fought out of this and then we delivered eventually and got good, which is a good sign that they're trying to fight out of it. Yes. But it seems like it went crazy, mm -hmm. that mistakes were made, even when they're opening the backer kit to sell more stuff. It's like, are you just needing more resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that's that what, what this it is? feels like to yeah. me. Yes. And so they, but one of the problems that popped up was games start shipping in May and it's like people either don't get their deliveries or something goes wrong. There's 30,000 people, so a percentage are going to have something go wrong. Or parts are missing. Well, especially if you're rushing. I mean, that's the, the thing that Robert always says is that, like, the percentage of accidents happening after one accident is exponential. Yeah, like, yeah. It, like once something goes wrong, once something goes, goes wrong, yeah. But the reality of, like, let's say you have a thousand of the 30 that have something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. and it's like now a thousand people are like, hey, I'm missing a part. It's like, did you get a bunch of spare parts printed? Was <laughs> no, that in your plan? No. no. Was, it, was that there? How did the um, box, how was it too small? I don't understand. Like, it wasn't. Who was measuring that? Wasn't there a? There probably. I mean, this is. There was probably some. It was the first number. run, it wasn't it? It was the first run. It was just the first. You yeah. didn't. You didn't test print beforehand. So and it's just. It's a. It's all the big learning experience in front of thirty thousand people. But that's how it comes across because they they wave it out right. And it's like we have the course set done, and there's huge demand for this game. There's a lot of people that want it that didn't get in on the Kickstarter. So what if we make more course sets instead of wave two and three, and actually create a sellable product? And then we do wave two, mm -hmm. we release wave two at retail. After that, we do wave three, wave three at retail, and you can do the math, and it's like, okay, well that could add up and we could be good to go Get here. Get out of here, um, But that doesn't make any decisions correct. Uh, it just is a... Well, I, in, a, in some sense, certainly in many, uh, many perspectives, it does make it correct, or at least if the, as we're seeing it, is uh, accurate, uh, which is, the options are never fulfill the game mm -hmm. because you run out of money to declare bankruptcy or do what you need to do to eventually fulfill the game even if it means yeah. PR is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's I don't know. I, I would love to know. Maybe so we'll talk to them Actually, about I, I should note, I'm actually checking my phone uh, like every moment right now. That's why I usually don't have this out during the podcast. If you guys are watching the YouTube video, you can see that. If not, um, can Actually, I reached out to Steamforged uh, yesterday, so it, it has not been very much yeah, time. And they're on, a, they're on a different time zone. And I said, hey, I'm sorry, it's really short notice. We just would love to have any kind of commentary on this from mm -hmm. the source itself. And what I will do is, in the next episode of the podcast, I'm sure that I'll get a response by then, and we can add that to the conversation, right. or I'll even like put it as a comment on the YouTube video and pin it to the top well, once I get something. Also worth noting that they did, they're, they're not hiding from this, they brought it up at Gamma. Yeah, uh, Charles right, right. had everything to say about Dark yeah, Souls. Yeah, what, what was kind of yeah, the, the I mean, vibe? The, it the, is coming, it's embarrassing. We're sorry, um, we may have mm -hmm. messed up, that kind of a thing. It's just head um, down, yeah. get it out at this point. Yeah, which is which is determination, which you, you want to see. And that's one of the things that hits me about PR is that 
it a lot of t a lot of people think that PR is what's happening now, but really PR is if you can if if they can make it through this if they can get everything out it'll be fine it'll be they they're doing what they can and it and sucks I, but I've seen a fair amount of that it. where like someone was like I haven't gotten money yet and it's at retail mm -hmm. right and that's frustrating yeah. yeah there's no amount of anything you can say or apologize for that makes that feel any better. Yeah. But at the same time, later would come back and say, I finally got it. Mm -hmm. There was an issue at customs or whatever. Um, and I understand that frustration mm -hmm. out of being let down, I yeah. guess. And there's yeah. nothing nothing to fix that. But it's also like another element of frustration there is I was missing a part and you're selling it at retail mm -hmm. and you aren't responding to me to get me my part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that just is a systems failure. Yeah. So it reminds me very much of PayPal. Remember when we listened to that? Are you going to bring it up? Yeah, bring so it up. Go for bring it. Yeah. Up. So there's this, there's this Masters of Scale podcast and they Peter do, they, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, Peter Thiel, and they do a what thing a on, on PayPal. That guy is. Yeah. And what I didn't realize about PayPal is when they first came out, they did not have the money or resources to deal with customer service. And they're dealing with people's money. I mean, this is a big deal. Like, they had, you know, let's say 30,000 to keep the number familiar, uh, requests. Like, hey, you know, I, something's gone wrong. I need some help. They didn't answer a single one of them for, like, months and months and months until the people found their phone number somehow. Someone was so frustrated. Mm -hmm. found, then they just unplugged their phone. So that went on for months and months and months. And then someone finally figured out where their office was and started showing up to get his stuff answered. And they still, they hired security to remove him from the office. They didn't have the means they to did not, actually they support had, that many it customers. Was, it was more important to them to get the platform to a place where it was scalable and useful and then hire customer support. Well, they, they, the thing is they knew that their product only succeeded if it reached saturation mm -hmm. because there was 7 million other processing options that were going to start springing up and you had to be the one that everybody's using because PayPal is only useful if everybody's using PayPal, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. So if you can get to that point, it's like we don't care about public relations and customer service right now. As long as we have 30,000 people signing up every month and we're losing 1,000, mm -hmm. we'll keep doing yeah, that's the, it. That's that's that the kind right of thing. Yeah. So <clears throat> not to say that that's the right thing to do by any stretch of the imagination, no, but to weird. say that, that it is a thing that is, that is commonly done and that has been successful. Uh, and that yeah. is sort of one of one of the options that you can do. Well, and I think, you know, for me, looking back through all this, it's pretty crazy because I wasn't involved in any of it during the time, but reading all these comments, um, is there's a fine line. I mean, I understand there was a lot of questionable decisions being made by Steamforge. Mm -hmm. uh, and, like, even and maybe it's what they had to do is, yeah. is the point. There's a lot of questionable decisions when you look at it from a backer standpoint. Yeah, just really from It makes backer. a lot of more sense when you look at it from me. i got to keep my business afloat standpoint. Um, but the other thing to me, I, I guess, that was interesting is how many of the, like, customer perspectives I felt were very... I guess off, mm. where it's like not to you know not to remove blame from Steamforge for mistakes that they made, but it's the kind of thing where it's like it's two years later and I don't have my Kickstarter you know yet. Mm -hmm. What's going like this is crazy. This is ludicrous, and it's like that's Kickstarter. Yeah, like yeah. every Kickstarter I've ever done, I've never had a Kickstarter show up on time. It's not even not even close. Kickstarter is the customer acting as a capital investor. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it was meant to be. Like, you're making a bet, and this is what uh, investors do all the time, right? This is the whole Silicon Valley, get your billion dollars, go start your startup and mm -hmm. have your software uh, company get bought out by whoever. Um, it's like, they're making a bet on, is this going to be successful? Are the fundamentals of this business strong? Does the leadership have the right idea? Is this product the right thing to bring to market? If I agree with that, then I'm going to put money in and I'm going to get an advantage in that I'm going to get a lot more money back. Mm -hmm. So the way Kickstarter works is the same kind of thing, except you put money in and you get essentially a cheaper slash discounted product mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the bet that you're making is that this is going to be worth doing and I will get in on a lower priced item and therefore save money by believing in it. Mm -hmm. But... I take on some of the risk in that, given that I am the investing body. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you invest 20000 into a startup that goes belly up the next month. So that's a part of the process that Kickstarter doesn't necessarily you know, advertise. As yeah. You get the advantage of being hosed sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, but it's cool because you get to make things exist that would never have existed mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm. And like the, I think, did you kickstart our whiskey infusers? I did. Yes, uh, and those were like, like, you know, those were six months late. I remember you e e emailed us like, hey, sorry, you're not getting a gift from my wedding because like, yeah, this yeah. is going to be late. Yeah. Uh, but the other side of that is that it allows you, obviously, to get involved in the, the some of the with games in particular. It's cool because it lets you get involved in the development of 
of the game, but it is it's not the case that you're pre-ordering a product that is guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but that's the mentality that has or has switched. And I and I should read this. Uh, I've been dying to read it. So this is Ninja Division. They just recently said, hey, we're not going to like deal with Kickstarter. Oh, this anymore. is the, yeah, you, this was... And they, they were the big... Um, about this. this drives me crazy. <laughs> Relic Knights. Uh, yeah, Relic mm-hmm. Knights, Soda Pop Miniatures, Relic Knights, that Super Dungeon Explorer, which is apparently makes Dark Souls look like the best run Kickstarter on Earth. Like Super Dungeon Explorer went into a void and was swallowed up by some demon mm. um, from everything that I know. Sounds so like a good story. I haven't looked at it at all. I just know that the stories around Super Dungeon Explorer, whatever it is, with uh, this company are insane. Okay. Like, and was it a similar story they got? They got had a super popular product. It was product, one of the biggest Kickstarters heads, ever. Had no idea what operations they needed to make it successful. I, and then, I guess so, <laughs> right? Um, so, but what was said here... Uh, This is a quote, the added toxicity, the way that it's swung online, talking about Kickstarter, has made us shy away from wanting to even be a part of it. I don't think that it's responsible for any of our external business partners to have to be exposed to that. It's not responsible for me to expose my employees to that. It's not responsible for me to expose my brands to that. So talking about the toxicity of these Kickstarter communities once they backed a game Mm -hmm. and are now complaining, et cetera. I have a lot to say about that, but I will add a second quote uh, here which is, I think, one of the more important pieces of this entire puzzle. Uh, Talking about, it made us look really hard at why we're using Kickstarter for our business. We have a great community we've been able to build up over time, but we've come to recognize that in our time working and developing in Kickstarter, that you run the risk, as a business, of your eyes getting too big for the plate. You build big projects, you want to be ambitious, you want to go after all this opportunity to give your customers all the things they want, We've gone through and redesigned whole products from scratch based on the feedback we get. We've added time to our time frames, and everybody just keeps thinking that it's okay. So here's the thing. <laughs> Weave me a story. I'm hey, get this box. This yeah, box. Ninja Division here, and uh, I think as a parallel to Steamforge, deserves all of the blame for any problems that you have during Kickstarter mm-hmm. because that is that stems from something, and it's not people backing that shouldn't be backing, mm-hmm. right? It's that you weren't prepared for success. You didn't have things lined out for this to be successful. Sure, it surprised you, but why did it surprise you? Mm-hmm. Right? Sure, you maybe couldn't have anticipated well, you it. Well, can limit each level of backing, so it's like you, you shouldn't go beyond what you're capable of. Right. You could have anticipated the uh, demand being high. You didn't, and maybe that was extremely difficult to see, and maybe mm-hmm. no reasonable or rational person would have bet on it, but it still happened, and you put the Kickstarter up. You decided what backers should get. You decided what the stretch goals were. You decided to send backer kits out. Like, that is all in your sphere of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to, like, any business that says, hey, we're going to do this amazing, great thing, spoils comes uh, to to mind, and then says, oh, no, it was, we could never have expected it to be this big, and now it's a complete disappointment, and now we're bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. So never, ever, ever, and this is the thing that I think uh, Steamforge has not really done, which is saying, like, this is the backer's fault. Right. They've for all, being taken overly as as toxic yeah. and whatnot, and it's like, hey, we just can't, like this to me reads the the uh, ninja. What is this ninja miniatures? What are they called? Ninja, ninja division. It reads to me like whenever we go to Kickstarter, we just can't help ourselves. Yeah, we get so excited and we just yeah. Yeah. we get so excited. We well, get overly ambitious. We have these awesome things. We redo everything from scratch, and, and then we fail fault. every time. Yeah. And it's like we just can't help. Who? Like, what could the possible solution to this problem be? <laughs> it's like stop shooting it, right? It's like. <laughs> Stop doing that. Yeah. Put your eyes back in your head. Mm-hmm. Be realistic. Be rational about things. Limit your Kickstarters mm-hmm. so that this doesn't happen. Um, and don't be overly ambitious mm-hmm. and actually deliver on the goods, right? And so to me saying we just can't help ourselves when we go to Kickstarter and now it's too toxic, it's like it's toxic because you're hosing people, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Like you, you have you a bad reputation. Yeah. Like people rarely, I mean, online can get very toxic very quickly, but it rarely spins up out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Usually, mm-hmm. there's some root cause, and then everybody jumps on the bandwagon. And I don't, I don't know where it, where it, where the like the the natural inclination for this comes from. But uh, so one of one of uh, my and Stephen and Robert's guilty pleasure shows is uh, Bar Rescue. And John Taffer. Things, John Taffer. And one of the things he embraces solutions, but one of the things that he does <laughs> is, uh, as part of the whole thing, he fills up the bar for the stress test. It's like, what does your bar look like when it's at its most possible successful? So Let's if get we succeed, fire code. make sure you aren't going to fail. Yeah, it's like, get to that point and then walk it back, yeah. not just be like, well, I hope we aren't super successful because then we can't handle it. Yeah. That seems like a really silly way to approach a problem. Not, 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 not understandable. 
But uh, I, you know, I, especially if you're like yeah, black and common. I can product. have empathy, but still like recognize that this is a problem that still sits very squarely at the kickstarting, you know, platforms, not platform, but the publisher's feet. Mm -hmm. And it could have been solved, and nobody blames you for the fact that you could, you didn't anticipate it. Mm -hmm. But yet here it is, and that's the key thing is like, we made the mistake in not anticipating it correctly, and now here's what we're going to do to solve it. Mm -hmm. And I think all of the problems no along the way just make that harder and harder every single time. But if they solve it, if they come out of this eventually, like mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, sure, that's cool. You get one, you get maybe two. Yeah. With Kickstarter, companies get six. Yeah. But, I mean. I think that's what brings me around to kind of the, you know, the ultimate question. We're going into God tier here. Uh, for people, there's a lot of people on the Dark Souls train. They're like, I'm never going to trust Team Forge again. No way. Um, but when I read back through it, I mean, I, it, it helps that I've met the people. And mm -hmm. I know that they are bummed out that they failed, right, in a lot of regards and made mistakes. Um, and they want to do something great and they want to change the industry and they want to build a real successful company, right, and yeah. exist, right? It's not just how can we cash grab off of Dark Souls on Kickstarter. They're really trying to do something. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, I get why people would be wary mm -hmm. of them going into God tier on a Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, and I think kind of the, as you were pointing out, like the thing that changes it to me as I'm reading these updates though is that, um, and they, they, I think what's missing is a direct ownership of specifics, which is like they will consistently say, hey, we're really sorry. Hey, we're sorry for the delay. Yeah. Hey, we're sorry for communication or lack thereof. Um, but they, you know, haven't said, as far as I'm aware, publicly, hey, it was really kind of crappy to launch another Kickstarter in the midst of this. Or it was crappy that we had to go to retail. Mm -hmm. But we, we had to go to retail. You know, like but that's they haven't said that. that. And yeah. I think that's the gap where it's like, and again, I get it, the human nature of not wanting to say Companies that. Companies are so uncomfortable well, saying um, that. Yeah, but well, the they don't want to see, like, let people see how the sausage is made. But the right. trick is, I personally am so endeared to those kind of companies. Mm -hmm. It's like, I can relate to your plight, and I can... I kickstarted you. Mm -hmm. Like I mm -hmm. want, I understand that you're a startup, and I want to make you succeed, right? And so, like, I think that could be so leveraged by mm -hmm. companies where it's like, you know, even it just ran as like space is way the future. Yeah, on that I, front. I yeah. really do because it's like the way worse than we were dumb mm -hmm. and we made a mistake or we were ignorant <laughs> and we didn't know and we've never done this before mm -hmm. is silence. Yeah, right. It's like, yeah. well, what if you're a backer? It's like now you have nothing left but to be frustrated. Yeah, embarrassment is one of the most powerful forces uh, right now that we're dealing with in society where people just don't want to admit they're wrong because they think that that will somehow make them weaker. And what you're saying, what I think is right, I mean, it's is just that vulnerability. It's you a can, human condition. Yeah, but I know it must be vulnerable. It ends up endearing you to people much more than it ends up running people off every single time. And the, the strange thing about it is that you could have essentially said, I mean, so if we're capital investors, let's say, and we invest, we would know those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, they would come to the board and say, we're strapped for cash. We have to do something or we're going under. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like you're getting the, like, you're giving the transparency of investment from all these people, but you're not giving them transparency of the health and wellness of the company yeah. that they've mm -hmm. invested in. Because if, if you had, I think this is a different story. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's the right answer. If it were us, I think that's definitely, we always kind of are willing to be like, if we can be transparent and maybe wrongly transparent or clammed up, mm -hmm. like let's just try. We're, we're going to like kind of veer towards transparency, and maybe it doesn't work out. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. Some, maybe we say too much, um, but that has never happened. Mm -hmm. You know, even like the uh, the thing that comes to to mind in our history that's somewhat relevant to Steamforged and at least DC is that like on privateer press video, mm -hmm. right? Like that was we can say nothing about how this all went down and just like move on or we can just explain to everybody how it worked and deal with the PR wins and losses from that. And we were like, well, we'll just go with transparency and mm -hmm. hope that it works out. And those things typically do work out these days. So I think that if you were to come out and say, we have to bring this to retail because otherwise we just won't ever be able to make this game and fulfill it for you guys. And then we have to launch this Resident Evil Kickstarter because we mm -hmm. literally don't have any money and we've already got all the assets designed for it and we need this to go now. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is a win. Yeah. I think I would see well, good things from that. And that even on the God tier front, right? Where it's like, if you're literally having to hit print because you don't have the funds to start making the models, right? It's like, you really are kickstarting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, no, we, we have need, about that. We need the funds to be capable of even thinking about doing mm -hmm. this. 
Um, so, you know, I mean, I think kind of you got to you gotta one, yeah, one, so one hard. Thing, one thing real quick it is, is that the, it's tough. one of the reasons I think companies don't do that is because they're afraid, especially on Kickstarter, that they will incite a certain amount of panic among their, uh, not yeah. saying something, keeps at least people on the hook rather than saying something be like, ah, oh, this whole company is going down. This is the end of things. So it's like it's like we tell all of everybody here. Um, it's one thing to apologize. It's another thing to apologize and have a plan on how you're going to make it better. And I think you need both those uh, both those aspects to really try to mitigate that panic a little bit. Because if they're like, hey, this isn't working out, here's our plan for the next six months. We're going to have to launch something for retail. We're going to have to launch something for Kickstarter. Here's why. Here's why we've thought about it. You know, this is the way it is. We will get you your stuff. Yeah. That's a little bit better. I mean, it's still hard, right? Because you, yeah. you don't want you don't want to cause that panic. You don't want to lose that goodwill. But it's that human nature that tells you to do this when ultimately, if you think, if you look at the numbers. And does would. anyone back Resident Evil if they're like, Steamforge is going bankrupt and yeah. they need us to back this? Right. Like, <laughs> right. kind of the yeah. problem so you too, have to right? weigh it, you know? It's like tough. there's, I don't know. Well, you and can... especially if you think you have a plan that is going to allow you to fulfill, good, to make good on this ultimately. Mm -hmm. And that t three years from now, it's gonna cool down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be a big deal. We're going to be fine, right? Because meantime, they're still doing Guild Ball. Mm -hmm. They've done the Resident Evil thing. They're working on God tier, obviously. Yeah. That's yeah. also happening. Because they're basically what they are now is a strange kind of in debt. You know, they have all of this product that they have to get out. It's not even strange. I think this is most. This is just straight up in right? debt. It's yeah, just yeah. normal. What and happens? Most startups do it. And then um, they get through it and everything. So I guess to kind of you know end it in yeah. this topic, and I would be curious enough for each of you, um, for people considering God tier or not considering it because of. His, historical reasons. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you trust Steamforge? Should you trust Steamforge yeah. as a backer? Or is that is that worth it? Uh, I will say that I definitely trust Steamforge. I will put my money on, and I will actually probably back uh, the uh, <laughs> the God tier. Go. He's obsessed. Yeah, I want to see it go. But at the same time, they have something to me that uh, has has really like given me confidence, which is just straight up, just you know, hardcore determination. Like, we are going to get this out. We are going to take the lumps that we have to to get through this forest and because we made this promise. And I think that even if a product is late, even if something weird happens to God tier, I will get my stuff. Uh, I want to help them out. And I also want to very much support a company that is so determined to make good on their promises. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotta, you gotta take I mean, I, I uh, you know, it's really easy to only see your side of the equation. I mean, that happens all the time. I'm guilty of that as much as anybody when it comes to like the way that things should be done. And I'm looking at it from my perspective alone. It's like, oh, this is easy to solve. Like a lot of comments on even this very podcast is very much from my limited perspective and thinking that like, oh, well, that's clearly the way to do it. Um, but if you take a step back and actually think about the realities that a company like this is probably facing, um, it's very easy to start to understand that some of these decisions that looked like very much slap your backers in the face decisions were probably we have to try to stay alive decisions. Yeah. Um, having now like looked back on a lot of history of various tabletop gaming entities and what has happened, now that we're, you know, I'd say in the past two to three years, we've been able to actually connect with companies on a much more um, personal basis, like when we're at Gen Con, we can talk to people like DC, uh, or we can talk to uh, like Andrew Navarro on camera mm -hmm. for Fantasy Flight Games. And you start to kind of learn that side of things, that perspective, like the publisher perspective on things. And I think the reality is just like, a lot of it is just scraping by mm -hmm. on a lot of uh, projects and things that you thought were hugely successful, where it's like, we only made a little bit of money or no money on this. That to me starts to kind of twist that understanding and have a more holistic look at like, man, so why would Steam Forged, for no reason, mm -hmm. essentially, take Dark Souls to retail, knowing that they have all of these backers that they're going to upset hugely, mm -hmm. knowing that these backers are already upset, they've already missed deadlines, and that they're getting all these contact forms so much so that they have to, to hire a new person. Two people. Two, two new people. So why would they just decide to do that mm -hmm. randomly? Yeah. It's like people don't really operate like that. Like they probably had to do it for some reason. Mm -hmm. You look at Resident Evil, it's like why would they start a Kickstarter right in the middle of all the, the angst that's going mm -hmm. on in their old one? 
probably for a good reason, mm -hmm. right? It's not some nefarious, we just really want to screw people over. <laughs> right. That never happens, right? <laughs> right. That yeah. very rarely happens. Uh, so there's probably a good reason for it. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy because it could be as simple as like, we had the license for this window for Resident Evil. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we were going to do it. We, we had, had to, to get it, it out. Yeah, but at, at the same time, uh, I think it's important to not be a, you know, purely an apologist for a publisher that sure. made bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And there are bad decisions that can compound by future bad decisions. And there are bad decisions that you just put your head down and you get through. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to do that a little bit better, maybe being more transparent, maybe being better with the updates, but seeing how some things have gone, whether it's Privateer Press with the end of Mompoc, where there's just four years of silence, mm -hmm. whether it's Wizards of the Coast with the Star Wars TCG, nothing, just complete silence. Seeing any amount of communication is good. Seeing a commitment to fulfilling these promises is good. I truly believe that that will happen with Dark Souls, and I think that there's going to be a huge sigh of relief at Steam Forge when mm -hmm. that goes down. I think Resident Evil is going to be fine. I think it's a more manageable product. Um, and then I think God's Tier is the most manageable of all the Kickstarters that they've done, mm -hmm. where they're literally just, I mean, these are champion models with a few followers. I don't know what the Kickstarter looks like, so I'm not sure if it's you know any kind of big, giant boxes, ambitious stuff going mm -hmm. on. But if the Kickstarter is fairly controlled, and you look at the basic model, which is like, a champion and any number of followers, we can do, let's say, 10, 15 of those in the Kickstarter. That's a pretty much standardized process, getting a box the same size with a, with a champion in it with X amount of followers, and we can produce those, and it's kind of a known quantity. Mm -hmm. And they've done that with Guild Ball. You know, they've produced these kind they of test, series test water, of, right. of releases. Um, so I just think it's a more manageable Kickstarter, and I think that they have a lot more experience in those slow drip miniatures games like, mm -hmm. like Guild Ball. Um, so of all the Kickstarters they've done, I would be the most confident in God Tier being successful. I also think, for me, I'm more likely to back it and be confident in it because I think it's just a more fun game. Mm -hmm. I think it's a more interesting game. Like, I don't need a giant $100 board game on yeah. my shelf. Like, that's cool. Uh, Resident Evil 2, like, it's fine. Like, I, I think I played yeah, it a few really times on too, PlayStation, yeah. right? I've been a big deal. But when I see God, God Tier and the decisions and the, the thinking that's going on behind that game, I'm willing to cut them some slack because I think it could break things open. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So my risk meter goes down a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. and I think okay. I was going to say that kind of leads to my my point, which is I feel like if anything, it introduced the kind of hesitancy that should be natural when you're kickstarting something. Yeah, maybe so. Which is, yeah, you need to look at the Kickstarter and ask yourself, like, can they actually pull this off? Because it took <laughs> me two minutes of looking at the Dark Souls Kickstarter, even two years later. It's looking at it, it's like, there's no way. Yeah, if like, you have to scroll more than sixty seconds to find out what the game is, because there's all these like backer awards and mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's like, like just. I mean, it reminds me of uh, basically. I mean, you just see it. And it's like, I know this is going to be crazy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the only way this gets pulled off is by a big company, and like. If you're kickstarting, you're probably not a big company, not, right? Not super big. I Unless mean, you're like the Simon model of like. But I, I, I have no idea anything about Simon. But I yeah. don't get a sense that they're this giant company. No, they're not. Nobody's either. giant in this industry. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, that's I mean the, Wizards is kind of okay sized. But I, guess. I, I think going into God tier for me, it's like Games Workshop probably. I would be as hesitant as I am for kickstarting anything, and to kickstart something, I would have to believe in what they were trying to achieve. And I think that's what why we're interested in God tier as a, as people and as a group, anyways is that we do think they are setting about with God tier specifically to achieve things that we believe in. Um, and I think leaning into that as a, as a company and kickstarting, it's like you've got to pitch that vision. You've got to make people believe in it, make people want to back it. Um, but it's, it, to me, it's just like any Kickstarter. And if anything, they have, a hu have, they have a history with a huge Kickstarter that went wrong basically at every turn. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have it seemingly demonstrated they've learned from that. It appears and, and that's that they've the important from part, yep. where it's not just... All right, we did you know giant Kickstarter game one. Let's do it again mm -hmm. three years late. Let's do it again three years late, and just keep launching these crazy yeah. Kickstarters. But again, I haven't seen the God God to Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I might look at it because this is a couple of days before it goes up, and I might have the same feeling, yeah. and I might yeah. not back it. Where it's like, well, this looks like it's concerning, mm -hmm. and I might not get this stuff for six years. Yeah. So yeah, they seem to just be making progressively better decisions. And is what what point do you want to jump on that train? Because it they are a company that I think is learning from their mistakes. I mean, look at our history. <laughs> you know, or you, don't. you do. 
Yeah. You do. You either learn from your mistakes, or you're probably not here in yeah. the next few years. So yeah, it took us. It took us what, like eight months to get out all the data tokens on the first. Yeah, uh, first yeah, yeah. Day. I mean, nobody's nobody's free from mistakes in life or in any industry, certainly. And so, as as your scale increases, your mistakes take a bigger toll. But if you learn from them, if you recover, um, and if you at least communicate throughout the process. I think you'll be okay. Yeah. So I, I think they'll be okay. They'll be okay. All right. Before we jump out of here, uh, we've moved the this week section uh, to this section real quick. Oh goodness, that was a long discussion. Yeah, we, we went into it. So real quick, anything notable happening in the lives of the Wolverine? Dude, Brothers? I'm watching uh, Westworld. What oh, episode are you, you got on? on it. Yeah, I'm on like six. I think uh, <laughs> Zach's been five. Zach's been telling me to watch it, but. I don't know, you, you guys listen and probably do similar things if you're smart uh, game players whoa, like I whoa. am, in that you, uh, you're you working those free trials. So I I essentially started a new <laughs> Amazon account so I could get a free trial of Amazon Prime, which came with a free seven-day trial of HBO. Mm, um, wow. So I'm that's, trying to, that's double dipping. I'm trying to get all of them done in seven days. How many episodes are there? Days. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just like started watching. I think it's yeah. eight or ten. Eight is like standard these days. So this is a show I, I watched first episode. And I've got two in, days left. In by love the way. with it. And then uh, Robert, which we'll have on at some future episode, I have to ask him about publicly. I uh, was like, watched the first episode and didn't like the editing. I don't know. Yeah, what that he means, wasn't. So. Yeah, he, he uses uh, that term a lot. I don't but know. and then uh, Stephen, you, you keep mentioning on the, it kept mentioning on the cast particularly about westerns and yeah. like, liking that. Theme. Has a dollhouse vibe too. And yeah, I, I was nice. a huge dollhouse. And I was fan. like, man, you gotta see Westworld. Yeah. Uh, it, when you're done, I'm amped to hear. It's what like you it has the same soundtrack as dollhouse. You know, you know, nice. you know, the second season's coming out. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I actually yeah. reminded me that you kept saying I need to watch it, so I did. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I've been, um, I've been working out. That's been, a, that's been good for you, man. I, I was in and out of that. You also I, circled the earth another time. I, I, yeah, I did. I'm 34 years old now. Goodness gracious. That's crazy. But the thing was, the, the, the biggest thing for me has been that on the way back from Adepticon, uh, Zach sort of informed me of all of the <laughs> stuff that he had learned about counting calories. That's so funny to and me. He had, he had said to me, once you start doing this, the whole thing changes. And he was he's right. Um, like I, I'm, I'm now like it's That's great. Awesome. It's I actually really cool. I, I was not expecting it to be a profound thing. Yeah, because it originally just like, well, well, my body's hungry; it needs to eat. But then you Raise realize in. it's like, well, you know, your body needs X many calories, and you can get them in a healthy way or a non-healthy way, and you can cut down to this many calories until we just fine. It's like, oh, I can fill up that key. Like that's actually that works really well with my brain. Um, and it's like you know, if you've only filled up this much, you start losing pounds, and here's how many calories equal a pound. It's fascinating stuff. Um, like to the point where now <laughs> it's I look, so good that I you're 34, the, and that's the first time this oh, is yeah, coming yeah. to work. Oh well, I mean, yeah, most people. It's great. Like, I no, always I love thought it. it was. I always thought it was some sort of witchcraft, like most yeah. nutrition stuff. Wow. Um, but it turns out, as you said, and, and I trust you. It's when you just said science, it, after all. Yeah, it's just science. <laughs> it's just science. Um, but so it, it got to the point um, where the other day I came home from the gym, and I was hungry. And I didn't want to eat a lot. And I looked at my salsa. And I, okay, this is how many calories. Salsa's great. And, I, and I looked at my chips. Ooh, said, yeah, be careful. It said like a, it was like 100 calories for 15 chips. Yeah. So I counted. 15. 15. Yeah. yeah. 15. And then I was done. If you don't count, sometimes it's like 60. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that's no, the problem. A lot of times. Yeah. That's the problem. But it, it's, it's worked really well. I feel I feel really good about it. It feels more like I'm in a video game, which is always yeah, like, nice. Like, like, manage it. Yeah, it's and great. And I'll tell you what, you can have about a pound of that salsa. <laughs> right. Low I was calories like drinking for days. that salsa. As yeah. long as it's not the like super sugar infused salsa. No, no, I found a great salsa. Which is salsa. It. And then you look at carrots, and it's like one calorie for 700 carrots. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, oh, I get it. Yeah, or like the box of spinach is like eight calories. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, for me, I actually am... So we're approaching uh, Star Wars Worlds. Mm -hmm. um, so if you thought I played a lot of Destiny before... Oh, wow. Sit back. <laughs> Hold tight. <laughs> the difference here, though, is that it's maybe one of the coolest things I've, I've been a part of um, in terms of preparing for a tournament. There's six of us from Tulsa that are going and playing. And... Uh, Eric Wainwright, who's one of the locals here, play a lot together. Uh, he's a very data-driven person. Mm -hmm. So uh, I set up a Google form that lets you put what deck you're playing, what deck you're playing against, who won and lost, oh, nice. whose battlefield were you on, how many times did you claim, and then notable cards. Uh, but he's doing these like matrices and like all this stuff. And we have six people, and we, we made a list of, like, here's the top ten meta decks, and we're going to build those, and we're just going to play a whole bunch of games against each other. Wow. So that we can do the math on what are the win percentages of the meta decks against each other, so that we can predict with some accuracy based on our, I assume we're any good at the game at all, uh, that which of the meta decks are most likely to be in the later rounds. So then you're making choices about what to put in your deck based on 
and you can track your own games against those things. Anyways, it's crazy. That's fascinating. Uh, so that's I'll, so I'll, awesome. I'll report on that more in, well, in the future. Well, and that's something you've been talking about doing for a long time, and certainly uh, old Paul Heaver has had some success with it, so I'm, I'm very excited to see where you go with that. Yeah, and then uh, final note, I saw you writing it over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment, a more somber moment, because one of our local community members passed away uh, recently, Jeremy Bright is his name, and he and his brother Kendall were very active players in our community and the general Tulsa community. So I uh, just wanted to say all of our kind of love and support to Kendall and the Bright family. If you're listening, uh, we're here for you. And anybody out there who is, you know, prayers or positive thinkers or meditators or uh, whatever, uh, send some some energy, some good vibes to yeah. the Bright family because they definitely uh, need that right he now. He will certainly be missed in the store. 100%, yeah. And other places, I imagine. Well, I have literally no idea how to uh, end the episode at this Let's point. Let's end it with Ask Covenant, shall uh, we? Ask Covenant, you can use the hashtag Ask Covenant, get your questions answered right here on the show. And uh, we always like to end with a question. So my question is, if you've been you know, listening through or if you're a part of the Dark Souls Kickstarter, what's your take on it? Um, can Steam Forge be trusted? Are you going to bag God tier? And uh, what's, what's your impression and thoughts on what all of this for Dark Souls and the Kickstarter means for Kickstarter and the tabletop game community. Until next time, keep playing.